I'm delighted to welcome Professor Aruka Okeke um, of the University of Aban from Nigeria as this year's winner of the Peter Wildley Prize. The Peter Wildley Prize is named after a distinguished virologist, much loved teacher, Peter Wildley, who was a president of the society from 1978 to 1981 and is awarded for outstanding contributions to microbiology education or the communication of microbiology to the public. A truly worthy winner of this award, Aruka's research search group uses microbiology, genetic and genomic methods to investigate the mechanisms bacteria use to colonize humans, cause disease and gain drug resistance. She also studies laboratory practice in Africa, contributes to collaborative genomic surveillance for antimicrobial resistance and communicates about microbiology to a broad range of stakeholders. Today, her lecture is on expanding access to microbiology and genomic research increases creativity. I welcome Aruka. Good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. It's an enormous honor for me to be here presenting the Worldy Prize. I'm really grateful uh, to the Microbiology Society for um, giving me the opportunity to, to, to share some of the stuff that we've been doing. So today I'm going to be talking about expanding access to microbiology and genomic research and how this actually increases creativity. Uh, before I get started, I really want to thank uh, my two uh, mentors, PhD and postdoc, uh, who really took a chance on me. Um, Adibayo Lamikara from Abafemi Iwolo University in Nigeria, and Jim Caper from the University of Maryland in, um, Niger in, in America. And I also want to thank four other individuals who would probably be surprised to see themselves here because they're actually role models. Uh, they've done things in the way they teach or do research that I have had the privilege to copy uh, and learn from them. Uh, they are Jenny Punt, and Phil Manili, who I met when I was in Haverford College. Neither of them are, are there right now. Uh, John Wayne, who I met by email and who uh, uh, allowed me to do a sabbatical in, in his lab and, uh, and then get introduced to genomics. And Chinendu Babalola, who was instrumental to my coming back to Nigeria at the University of Ibadan. So um, having uh, acknowledged just a few of the people that have helped me on my way uh, uh, in my scientific career, I also have to acknowledge the fact that the way we are trained as apprentices to great scientists, it, it builds expertise, but it also builds an old boys club. And what that means is that if you're not in the know, it's very difficult to get in. Uh, John Wayne and I, several years ago, wrote a, a, a review about um, the fact that many things about science were like a fast-moving merry-go-round. And for you to get on, it either had to slow down, and you know that science never slows down. Or you had to break into a run and jump on, and only a few people can do that. Or someone had to pull you in. Um, the fast-moving merry-go-round is, is, is uh, not so much created by the science, but the way we manage the science. There's a Matthew effect in science, which Robert Merton wrote about in the journal Science uh, several decades ago. Essentially, it, it suggests that the more you have, the more you get. And we know this. The more grants you have, the easier it is to write a successful grant proposal. There's also a Dr. Fox effect that is fading away due to Google and, and, and the fact that you have a smartphone in your hands. But in general, when someone introduces you as the most important science, scientist, it's typical that your audience believes it. And that means that people who have the connections to get those kind of introductions are more likely to get ahead in science. And then there's a Cinderella and Ugly Sisters effect. There are lots of people who contribute to science that don't actually get credit for it, that are in the back uh, scrubbing and, and making things shine, but uh, at the end of the day, it's going to be really difficult for them to get to the ball. And then finally, the um, late Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe talked about a little brother effect uh, in literature, which I have also observed, of course, in, in science, where if you have a mentee, 
uh, there's, a, there's a good chance that that mentee remains a little brother for the rest of your life. As someone who has a little brother who's an economist and who for now I give every, he gives me every kind of economic and financial advice, we really have to understand that little brothers grow up and they could even become bigger and better than we are. So um, what I'm going to be talking about during, during my uh, presentation is, is the efforts that I've made uh, across uh, my career to bring people into microbiology and genomic science who uh, are typically on the outside. Uh, some of them are considered too young, others are considered too poor, too poorly prepared, and others are just too busy, distracted by other things that are very important to them and wouldn't necessarily continue uh, uh, consider a, a microbiology career. And interestingly, I'm not just going to talk about bringing people in. I'm going to talk about how bringing them in has actually made my science more creative, how it's been good for me. So let's start with too young. So as a faculty uh, uh, member, my career started in a small liberal arts college in the United States of America. Liberal arts college is actually undergraduate universities. This means that we have no graduate students. We can have postdocs, but many of us, including myself, choose not to have them. Uh, the college I worked at was called Haverford College. Uh, it's, it's very nearby and shares a curriculum with another college known as Bryn Mawr College, which is a women's college, and they're in Pennsylvania, not far from um, Philadelphia. Now, in your undergraduate uh, genetics class, you've probably heard about Thomas Hunt Morgan at Columbia University and the fly room and how he figured out that um, certain genes in flies were on, the, were on the X chromosome. He then went on with his group to figure out how to map genes in eukaryotes. And this was an important turning point in genetics because it, it finally uh, allowed genetic uh, uh, characteristics to be positioned on chromosomes. If you read about Thomas uh, Hunt Morgan's group, what you realize is that most of the people in it, including Alfred Sturtevant, who figured out mapping, were actually undergraduates. And it's a bit of a surprise that somebody at Columbia University was doing all this fantastic research with undergraduates. In actual fact, Thomas Hunt Morgan spent most of his career at Bryn Mawr College. He moved over to Columbia later on, and that's where the fly room was. But he had already learned that you could do really creative things with undergraduates because they're not spoiled with some of the foundation that we get. Most of the foundation that we get is incredibly useful. Some of it is harmful. And so having undergraduates in your group really helps to balance that. If you're skeptical about the fact that undergraduates can can contribute not just technically, but intellectually to your research. Be aware that there's at least one published paper by elementary school kids in the UK. And the kids made intellectual contributions. What you have on the slide there is uh, their hypothesis. And one of the figures from the paper, I took it directly from the paper. So it's quite possible for anyone at any journey in their scientific career to make an intellectual contribution. Of course, they needed some help. And one of the um, 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 scientists that work with the students said that they couldn't have an introduction that had a literature review of this, in this paper because obviously the, the kids could not understand the literature. So definitely we have to think about ways to engage people so that they can make intellectual contributions, but it is possible. So it was actually difficult for me to decide which example to talk about. I've had so many experiences where an undergraduate made me look at what I thought I knew uh, and realized that I knew it wrongly. I des I've decided to talk about Adobe Wanyeshidu, who was an undergraduate student at Haverford College in the first year that I arrived. Um, so she did this project, which was published in the Journal of Bacteriology. Um, um, obviously, she was with me for just a year, and so the finishing up was done by another excellent uh, undergraduate, Tanya Muchi. But I'm going to spend most of the time talking about Adobe's part of the, of the um, uh, uh, project. Uh, so for those of you who don't know enteropathogenic E. coli, it's a type of E. coli that causes diarrhea. Uh, it has a, a, a pathogenicity island on the chromosome, and strains that are referred to as typical enteropathogenic E. coli have a large plasmid. The plasmid uh, carries genes that encode a bundle-forming pillus, as well as a plasmid-encoded regulator that activates the pillus genes. So there are two prototypical strains of uh, enteropathogenic E. coli, and naturally their plasmids were the first to be sequenced. Uh, 
Strain B171 has a smaller plasmid. Strain uh, E2348 has a larger plasmid, PMAR7. And they both have these bond-forming pillars and plasmid-encoded regulator genes on them. The major difference between these two plasmids is that PMAR7 from strain E2348 actually um, has a, a conjugative system. Now, I knew from working in Nigeria and from working with colleagues that were working in uh, South America that there were strains that are epidemiologically relevant that have large plasmids that have truncated bundle-forming pillar genes and, and, and uh, um, plasmid encoder regulators with point mutations in them. So they essentially had inactivated two of the major virulence factors on the plasmid. And yet these strains were epidemiologically relevant. So I was curious to know what exactly was on their plasmids. Today, I probably would have just, you know, um, um, extracted the DNA, Lumina sequenced it, and answered the question. But at that point, it just wasn't possible. So my plan was to actually take the plasmids from those strains and do a subtractive hybridization to find genes that were on those strains and not on the plasmids that um, uh, had been sequenced earlier. And so when Adobe walked into my group, I suggested that, hey, why don't we do this? And she said, this is fabulous. And she spent the first few weeks just learning how to do plasma prep so that she could see plasmids in the different strains. And she got pretty good. Actually, hers are slightly better than mine. And one of the things that she noticed was that the strains that were atypical, as well as the strain B171 that had, the plasmid had been sequenced before, she always saw a doublet band where the large plasmid should be. And she told me, these strains have two plasmids. And I sat her down, I opened the right textbook, and I said, you know, they're different forms of the plasmid. You know, there's a supercoiled, there's the relaxed, they run at different levels, and this is what you're seeing. She said, yeah, but if I'm seeing that, why don't I see that in E2348, where I only see one band? And I didn't have an answer to that. So it was fine that we were going to approach answering the question the same way, but we started off with two different hypotheses. I was all about finding the new genes in these uh, atypical strains, and she was about proving me wrong there were two plasmids in this strain. And no surprise, she was right. So why is it that I and everybody in the enteropathogenic E. coli field that has studied strain B171 as a prototypical strain had never figured out that there was a second last pl large plasmid in there? Uh, the plasmids are very similar in size. Um, P, uh, B171 actually has no triagenes, as I mentioned, but if you read carefully in the literature, as I did after Adobe made her finding, uh, you actually see that there was a paper where they actually conjugated this plasmid that had no conjugation genes. So obviously it was mobilized by something else. Um, and then if you went to the database, there was a, um, an entry of a plasmid-borne gene that had been submitted eight years prior and never published. And it was obviously because the authors couldn't find where the gene was on the plasmid when it was sequenced. Of course, the gene was on the other plasmid. So we co-opted uh, Del Pickard, who can run uh, these vertical gels, uh, just to see whether Adobe was right. Uh, she had used pulse food gel electrophoresis. She'd done the subtractive hybridization. So we knew she was right, but we needed to convince editors and reviewers that that was the case. And uh, he was able to do these vertical acrylamide genes that show that the atypical uh, enteropathogenic E. coli typically have a minimum of two large plasmids. They often have very, very many others that had been invisible to the field. Um, just to give you sort of the after story, very recently we were able to collaborate with Dave uh, Rasco and Tracy Hazen and, and sequence that second plasmid, which they too had missed in Illumina sequencing, uh, um, and then um, be able to annotate it. It has its own conjugation system. It has a bunch of antimicrobial resistance genes. Both of these were identified by Adobe using traditional genetics methods while she was working. The CSI gene that had been submitted by uh, uh, the other investigators before was located on that plasmid, as was another virulence gene. So my hypothesis was actually supported, um, but um, it, it's really fabulous that an, an undergraduate student was able to show that the genes I was thinking of were not actually on the uh, enteropathogenic virulence plasmid, they were on a separate plasmid. 
what happened to Adobe? Uh, she finished her undergraduate degree, went and did an MD PhD degree, um, became the chair of a dermatology program in Temple, and recently relocated for family reasons to Laredo, Texas, where she's one of the top uh, dermatologists in the state. So uh, Adobe, I like to take a lot of credit for her, but it's pretty clear from what I told you that she pretty much trained herself with me peeping over her shoulder. Uh, but I arrived at Hanford College in her final year. And one of the things I was uh, pretty um, um, impressed by was the curriculum that we had, that we inherited. Uh, it was put together um, decades before by four uh, incredible, uh, three incredibly, well, let's call them four, three, inc four incredible incredible scientists, uh, of which three were Ariel uh, Irv and Mel, Mel Santa. Only, Mel Santa is the only one that I met, and he's a microbiologist. Uh, we had a lot of really nice conversations. And the curriculum is really focused on molecular science, which most biology departments criticize because it means that the, 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 the students are narrowly focused. But what it does is it allows us to give them a lot of depth very quickly so that by the time they're in their final year, they really are our collaborators. Um, so in their first year, they don't do any biology at all. They do chemistry, physics, computer science. Second year, they do a year long, it's a pretty difficult course um, uh, to basically get the foundation in cell biology, biochemistry, genetics, and in what we call regulation. Um, and then in the third year, they do something which we call super lab, which is an inquiry-based lab course. It's actually an experiment uh, that is devised by two instructors that are teaching it, but it's open-ended, so we don't know the outcomes. So at Haverford, I had the privilege of, of designing, co-designing, and teaching many, many different super labs. Uh, I do want to give a, a credit to the fourth member of that group, Slavika uh, uh, Matetik, who often doesn't get credited for building this amazing Haverford curriculum, but built the super lab piece of it. Um, and in, in that lab, we have had uh, examples of students who have gone on to continue that research in their senior research, or even group presentations or group publications from Superlab experiments. Uh, one example uh, from uh, um, two of the Superlabs that I taught uh, with Phil Manili is that we were able to find pathoadaptive genes in a pathogen I work with known as enteroaggregative E. coli using a model system in C. elegans. This is something I would never have done myself. I don't know one end from a, of a worm from another, although somebody once joked that I would know as soon as they got diarrhea. Um, but uh, Phil is a, is, a, is a worm geneticist. And I'm a microbiologist. We didn't have any research in common, and then we found ourselves teaching Superlab together. And so we devised this Superlab. The students are completely unafraid of both bacteria and worms, and then we're able to not only set up the model, but also use the model in the first Superlab to screen for pathoadaptive genes, and in the second Superlab to do a transposome mutagenesis screen. If you've done a transposome mutagenesis pathogenesis screen in worms, you'll know it's tedious. A lot of worm picking. But if you have a whole class picking worms for you, then it means that you can actually get pretty good coverage in the seven weeks that it would take to, to teach a super lab. I'm not at Hanford College anymore. I'm at the University of Ibadan. I still teach undergraduates, but I teach in a pharmacy curriculum where there's a, um, um, uh, a little bit more rigidity in terms of what we can offer at the undergraduate level. Um, and I also teach in a graduate program now. So in addition to having graduate programs in my lab, I teach some courses to master's students. And one of the things I wanted to do right off the bat is to set up an inquiry-based uh, lab. And the first one we did was actually transported from Haverford College. It's the same lab I developed with plant scientist uh, John Wilson to look at the phylosphere of, of plants. In Haverford, we're looking at the phylosphere of plants on the Haverford College campus. In Nigeria, I was working with a colleague, uh, Moreni Kekoka, who studies medicinal plants. And we decided that we would look at the phylosphere of medicinal plants, because this is really understudied in the literature. And if you think about what medicinal plants do and how they're used, the phylosphere is really important. So we've had a phylosphere lab. Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, setting up the lab was supported by an an International Development uh, Fund Award from the Microbiology Society, thanks so much. Um, we've run it for about three years now. We've had um, um, graduates from it who learn a range of techniques 
ranging from identifying medicinal plants and validating them to being able to do uh, microbiome research. And one of the students who did one of these labs actually took it into his PhD and is doing more sophisticated studies of the phylosphere. And if you were in the Block A paper uh, 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 poster session, you would have seen Anderson's poster, uh, which is up there at this meeting. The second inquiry-based lab that we've taught has had to do with water quality across Ibadan. Groundwater in Ibadan is actually very, of very poor quality. It's often, often fecally contaminated. And so our students are very invested in looking at public water sources, understanding uh, what their quality is, finding pathogens if they are there, and characterizing these pathogens and comparing their genomes to the um, uh, genomes of organisms that we get from people who have diarrhea. It took a while, but I finally found, uh, this time in the literature, an inquiry-based lab that actually contains many of the techniques and skills that we have to teach in the pharmacy curriculum. And so beginning this year, we are now teaching uh, um, the PEAR uh, inquiry-based lab, uh, Prevalence of Antimicrobial Resistance in the Environment, to our second-year pharmacy students. And it essentially covers half the school set, that, uh, skill set that they need to get in year two pharmaceutical microbiology. And it's, it's, it's amazing to just look at the students being more engaged because they have um, an outcome that they're looking for that we don't know, and then it becomes easier for them to be able to learn, learn uh, these techniques. Uh, many thanks to the PEAR Consortium for um, helping us out with setting this up in a resource-limited way. Um, and also many thanks to colleagues uh, who take the trouble to publish their inquiry-based labs. Uh, it's something I've never done and I've been motivated because I was helped in the literature. Those of you who were here a few years ago would, would have heard uh, Graham Hatful's uh, Wildy talk on, on sea phages and know how impactful that is for undergraduate education. So um, I could go on and on about all the stuff I've got from uh, working with undergraduates in research, but we are limited for time. So I'm going to move um, away from Haverford College to Nigeria and to the African continent, where unfortunately scientists are often excluded, including microbiologists ex excluded from microbiology. Uh, a lot of this is not deliberate. Um, if you're here and you're a PI, think about who your uh, microbiology mentor was and then I'm pretty certain that you could trace them, their genealogy, back to Robert Koch. Almost all microbiologists a generation ago either worked with Koch or worked with somebody who worked with somebody who worked with somebody who worked with Robert Koch. And in my field of bacterial pathogenesis, the same is true for Stanley Falco, who was an amazing scientist. I didn't work with him, but Jim Caper, my, PA, my postdoc supervisor, actually worked with Stan Falco. And so what that means is that if you're geographically removed from Robert Koch and Stan Falco, there's a good chance that you're not really integrated in the field, even though you are of the field. Um, and this is something that African scientists have voiced again and again. And it's important not just for our practice of science, but also for what we can discover. Uh, the malaria community uh, a couple of decades ago remarked that progress was slow because African malariologists were not properly integrated in their field. And they've done a lot to be able to change this. Uh, this is not uh, just a malaria problem. Let me give you an example from bacterial genomics, a field that I work in, and from an outbreak of diarogenic E. coli, which again is a field that I work in. And uh, Sharon Peacock touched on this outbreak very briefly last night. Uh, she mentioned that in 2011, there was an outbreak that started in Germany and spread across Europe, uh, where thousands of people uh, got bloody diarrhea and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Ultimately, this uh, um, uh, outbreak was found to be due to a, an unusual strain of enterohemorrhagic E. coli that also had genes from enteroaggregative E. coli. Enteroaggregative E. coli is a neglected pathogen that I study in my lab. And so this was really a hybrid pathogen. And the fact that it was a hybrid is something that was discovered by sequencing the genome of this organism. As Sharon rightly mentioned, at that time, sequencing, the democratization of sequencing was actually quite new. And so uh, one of the things that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine was the fact that, you know, in just a, in the space of a few months, we had the genome of this organism. But then there was a huge barrier. Now there are tools for automating the annotation of genomes. In those days, those tools did not exist. It had to be done manually. 
And so what was done that was innovative at the time was to take this genome, put it online, and ask the scientific community to contribute in a crowdsourced way to annotate the genome. And I heard Mark Palin speak about this, and he said that essentially um, it was amazing. In, in I don't know how many weeks, the whole genome was annotated. It was crowdsourced, and you know, people from four continents contributed. Now, I've since come to learn, and after I had actually written about this, that part of the reason why uh, the crowdsourcing was so effective was that it actually started at a conference. Uh, but the other thing is that I was very curious to know why it was four continents. As you know, you know, however you count the continents, there are more than four. So um, I asked Mark, I sent him an email, and I said, what were the four continents? And he said, Europe, North America, Asia, and Australasia. Now, why this was particularly pertinent for this outbreak is at the time the genome was finally sequenced, the strain that it was most similar to was an enterogative E. coli strain that was isolated in the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo. You would think that as Africans, we had the greatest interest in understanding this pathogen. And none of us were involved in this crowdsourcing activity. Uh, and the question becomes, why? Um, so uh, shortly after that, I did a trawl through the literature to pull out all the bacterial comparative genomics papers for which the journals had uh, um, requested that the author contributions be written on the paper. And there weren't that many in those days. There were just nine. And it turns out that there's a range of author contributions from everywhere, and that everybody had to, I mean, these are comparative genomics papers that are bringing in genomes from around the world, so everybody had to bring in materials, okay? But when you look at the African scientists, what you see is that outside of South Africa, they were only bringing in materials. This is a huge problem. It's a problem that is shifting, but not fast enough. And it's a problem that African scientists are concerned about. I, I did mention the four malariologists who wrote that opinion piece in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And there's also this uh, uh, more direct uh, um, uh, statement from uh, um, Professor Tomori, who, who, who talks very directly and should, that essentially African scientists are not pleased about this and that we need to be uh, contributing more than just materials. We need to be contributing intellectually uh, to the work that's being done. As I'll mention later in the talk, things are shifting, but they're not shifting fast enough. Uh, there's a report that came out just a couple of weeks ago that looked at the 2020 COVID-19 papers about Africa. And I imagine that everybody in the world should have been cons uh, interested in what was going on in Africa because in spite of all predictions, we had a better uh, uh, pandemic. And the question becomes why? And we're only just starting to find out the answers uh, to why. But it turns out that of the 2020 COVID-19 papers, 66% 66 of, 66 of the authors were not from Africa. And one-fifth of the articles had no African author at all. And they were writing about COVID in Africa at a time when nobody was traveling. So um, I think we really have to think about um, um, how we ensure that scientists from the places that we are studying are included. And I'm not going to go through details of what is being done to fix this, except to say that a lot is being done. And uh, there are ways that if you're not on the African continent, that you can actually contribute to that. Uh, and then to say that uh, some of us are at least trying to call it out um, in direct ways, like uh, Professor Tomori, and indirect ways using satire, like me. The other thing I wanted to remark on is uh, there's a recent paper from um, uh, Sheye Abimbola, who's the editor of uh, BMJ Global Health, that says that knowledge about the Global South is in the Global South. There is actually a lot of knowledge that is not accessible via databases because it's not indexed. And so one of the things that I've tried to do across the course of my career is to um, work with scientists that are working in that literature space to encourage them to publish uh, in index publications. I started this uh, with mentorship with the Journal of Infections in Developing Countries that was set up by Salvatore Rubino and John Wayne. 
and then uh, later on became the editor-in-chief of the African Journal of Lab Medicine, which is an index journal, but is African. Because one of the things that uh, Shea Bimbola uh, uh, rightly criticizes is that, well, why should we have to publish in a, in a, in a foreign journal uh, just to be, to be recognized? And in addition to the fact that these journals provide mentored peer review processes so that first-time authors can publish articles that uh, uh, look like the articles that we're familiar with, um, one of the things that being an editor of this journal allowed me to do was actually to identify and train editorial staff that were based in Nigeria. So actually from our postgraduate curriculum, I was able to find postgraduate students that had a flair for writing and then work with our managing editor, Bethany, to train them to become extremely competent uh, editorial uh, assistants. One of the reasons why it's really important for um, us to write and not just to be co-authors on articles that are written is that as our uh, recent and current director of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control have said, is that we actually need to tell our own story. The way we tell it will be slightly different from the way that um, other people tell it for us. And in order to make this happen, we will need to have collaborations when we work with others because we must work with others. We need to have collaborations that are rooted, that include co-creation as well as um, co-implementation. Now, um, in one of, the, one of the places where this, to my, to somewhat to my surprise, has happened quite well is genomic science. Uh, genomic science started off uh, uh, in a very uh, worrying way, as I showed you with the bacterial genomics uh, paper where uh, we were often conduits for scientific material. But come the pandemic, Africa's, African scientists have actually been able to showcase leadership in, in, in genomics. Um, so um, this is fantastic because the molecular biology re revolution that came on the back of Watson and Crick's paper um, actually didn't quite take off in most African countries. There were a few sites, centers for excellence, where people were doing molecular biology, but your average biological scientist in Africa was not doing molecular biology before the genomic revolution. And this is some of the reasons, some of the reason why uh, many scientists were locked out of what was going on globally. Uh, but with genomics, that seems to be different. And uh, what we're seeing now is that African labs, not just research labs, but also public health labs, they're getting Illumina machines, they're getting access to nanopore sequencing, and we're at the cusp of something that could really take off in a very, very interesting, uh, interesting way. Um, uh, and this is fabulous because we really don't need a molecular biology revolution at this point. We need to leapfrog that and, and then start a genomic revolution and be at the forefront of that. And that really happened with the, with the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, epidemic, uh, starting with uh, scientists like Tulio Oliveira and Christian Happy. Um, African scientists were very, very quickly learned to be able to sequence, assemble, analyze um, um, SARS-CoV-2 genomes. Uh, a lot of that has been talked about by them uh, that were leading it, so I'm not going to say much more than this. But what it did then is also to um, create a large body of young people who are interested in genomic science, and some of which actually have the foundation to be able to work on it. Now, we actually started working on genomics slightly before the pandemic, and so we were a little bit of an oddball at that time. Uh, we had uh, bright students and uh, clinical scientists who were interested in the outcomes of, of genomics and were well positioned at a university uh, um, to be able to start using genomic science to look at antimicrobial resistance. So what we did was, uh, in addition to our research, is actually to set up a surveillance program in collaboration with uh, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And one of the, um, um, aside from routine surveillance, we did offer our Sentinel labs the option of sending us isolate sets if they thought they had an outbreak. And the first uh, uh, group to um, take advantage of this uh, was actually a resident, uh, Emmanuel Irek, who said, I think we have an Acinetobacter outbreak in our ICU. And I don't really have much to go on it, except that I'm getting more Acinetobacters than I used to get. Can you sequence them and tell me what's going on? So uh, Irek worked with Ekesin Odi, uh, one of our brand new bioinformaticians at the time. 
um, and they sequenced the Acinetobacters that uh, Eric brought, as well as uh, other Acinetobacters from elsewhere in his hospital and from the region in southwest Nigeria. And they found that Eric was actually correct. Uh, he did have an outbreak in his, uh, in his ICU, which thankfully has since, since abated, uh, but that there was another outbreak in the hospital that was not recognized until we sequenced those, um, those isolates. And this has been a repeated uh, um, thing that we see now that our gen genomic surveillance is more extensive, is that there's a lot going on that we were unable to see because we weren't using uh, uh, methods that were sensitive enough, and this is something that genomics can actually uh, help us to address. When Eckerson joined my group, he was a master's uh, uh, student working with somebody else, finishing up his master's program, and telling me that he was really interested in doing genomics. He was thinking of going to do a PhD abroad. Uh, I managed to convince him to stay with us, and he was able to do um, a, a split-site doctorate program with Copenhagen University, which he's finishing off right now. And um, these are actually extremely rare. Um, I've only had one student who's doing a split site program, even though I have several, several prospective students who would like to do this. So as you think about this, as you go back to your universities, think about how nice it would be to have an African scientist do half of their PhD in your university and be able to get the opportunity of networking that working in a larger scientific community offers, as well as the opportunity to study important questions that are back home. And as you think about this, think about the European or American or Asian scientists that would benefit a lot from spending part of their PhD in an African university. I think we could do a lot if we collaborated on programs uh, uh, this way. As I mentioned before, there are programs like this, but they are rare. Now, um, Eckerson's thesis is actually on um, Acinetobacters, uh, which haven't been well studied in Africa at all. They're mostly misidentified, so actually people who are isolating them don't know that they're finding them. This is a, um, a, um, a meta-analysis of our Senetobacter genomes that were available in 2018 worldwide. And what you can see is that of 3,575 genomes, only 20 were from, were from Africa. And so while there was a lot said about what we know about Acinetobacters and which uh, carbapenemase genes they had, we really knew nothing about what was going on on the African continent. So um, for his thesis, Eckerson has really been looking at Acinetobacters from Nigeria. Uh, what you see from this figure is that the vast majority of them uh, have novel sequence types, which means they're sequence types that are not yet being catalogued. Um, and that um, although he's finding um, um, BLA OXA23 as the most common um, uh, carbapenemase gene, and this is true worldwide, in Nigeria we have more commonly NDM1 as the, as, as the commonest um, uh, carbapenemase gene. And that although we hypothesize these would be on plasmids based on what's known in other parts of the world, all of his carbapenemase genes are actually on transposons on the continent. I have to say, I'd uploaded the slides before I got the email from Eckerson that his paper is out. So uh, you can look at it at M Sphere, or you can go to BioArchive. So this is just one of several examples of bacterial pathogens where we're realizing that the population structure in Africa, the resistance genes and the epidemiology is slightly different. And that's not a surprise. Uh, whether you believe that humans were created or they evolved from pre-humans, whatever, whatever you believe, it happened in Africa. And so we expect to see more diversity on the African continent than anywhere else. And I would argue that until we understand the diversity on the African continent, continent, we're not going to understand what's happening everywhere else. In the few minutes that I have left, I just want to talk about um, uh, the opportunities I've had to interact with uh, people who are stakeholders in microbiology science, but are not necessarily doing it. And the interesting thing about this is that in this case, people are not coming to me. I am going to them and saying, this is how microbiology would make what we are doing better. And uh, they include uh, clinical scientists, they include public health epidemiologists, they include policymakers, and they include scientists who are working in other disciplines uh, which could uh, uh, gain something from microbiology science, microbiology science or um, um, 
um, from genomics. Um, and working in Nigeria has made it not only easier, but also more necessary to do this kind of, uh, to set up these types of interactions. Having a research lab or even a clinical research program is not enough to make sure that microbiology impacts society because our resources are so limited. So uh, one of the things that we uh, uh, um, uh, started with was setting up a surveillance system in Nigeria in collaboration with the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And this was actually very difficult to do for one important reason, and that was the fact that there was no lab in Nigeria that could serve as a national reference lab. If you don't have a reference lab, you don't have a surveillance system. And when you think about what goes into antimicrobial resistance, there are lots of different pathogens. And so setting up reference lab services using traditional methods means that you have to set up lots of different things. It would have taken us at least three to five years to set up a reference lab. But with genomics, we could do that very easily because with genomics, you can provide reference, all the reference lab services uh, using the same technology. And so we are actually twinned uh, with NCDC as the reference lab uh, for antimicrobial resistance surveillance. And I'm not going to go into details of how we set that up and how we rolled it out, because um, um, we have published with the consortium that we're working with, the Global Health Research Unit for Ge uh, Genomic Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance, which is an NIHR supported consortium that is using genomics for surveillance in uh, lower and middle income countries. We have laid out all the operational challenges we had uh, with setting up whole genome sequencing, including setting up the lab, uh, setting up the bioinformatics pipelines, good financial grant practice, and um, um, we're still struggling with our supply chains, but it is certainly something that we're working on. And then actually setting up Nigeria's AMR reference lab that was uh, published a year ago in microbiology, it's open access. I, 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 I encourage you to read it. And really want to thank uh, Andrew Preston, who when I gave a talk two years ago at the Microbiology uh, Society meeting said, you should submit this to microbiology, so thank you. So in setting up the surveillance system, we of course had to do lots of training of scientists so that they could do the microbiology. But one of the things we noticed was that the genomic results that we were getting out of uh, using genomics for reference lab services were not really well understood by the stakeholders. And I'm really pleased that one of my postdocs then, Ayo Afolayo, took it upon himself to write a proposal for a small grant to actually build um, genomics appreciation capacity in laboratory scientists and in epidemiologists that were using this data. And he constructed a team from members of my lab who were doing genomic science. They did this on an entirely uh, volunteer basis. They ran it by themselves. Um, and essentially, um, they were able to develop user-friendly user workflows uh, and standardized reports that um, the, the uh, stakeholders could use. They were able to organize virtual training sessions. And then they're still following up this cohort to ensure that they can understand the information that we are feeding them from genomic surveillance. Um, again, as I mentioned, working in Nigeria has uh, uh, given me the privilege to do more on the policy side. Um, a Lancet Commission for Nigeria was recently set up, and I, was, I had the privilege of being part of that, and really talking about how over the next 10 years we want to solve many of Nigeria's health problems, including the need for more microbiology at the diagnostic level in Nigeria's um, uh, um, health system. Uh, the report was launched, it's also open access online. Uh, the report was launched uh, uh, earlier earlier last year, um, and uh, you're welcome to read it and see what, what uh, hopes and plans we have for Nigeria. With the few minutes I have left, what I'd like to talk about is our venture into drug discovery. And as I mentioned before, I do microbiology, I do genomics. Uh, I was really reluctant to do SARS-CoV-2 sequencing during the pandemic because I am a bacteriologist and it is a virus. Uh, but you know, the pandemic caught up with all of us. We did do, I, we did do a bit of it. Uh, but essentially, I'm, I'm, as much as I'm very broad about who I let into my group, I'm actually very narrow about what I think my specialization actually is. And so it was a big stretch to decide to go into drug discovery. But one of the things that made this an imperative is that drug discovery is believed to be something that doesn't happen in Africa. 
People develop drugs and then they give them generously to Africa and then we use them. The problem with that model is that sometimes the drugs that we need are not the ideal that come, come, come out of that production line. And so we really need to be developing our drugs. And there have been a couple of really nice initiatives in the last few years. Uh, some of you who know Kelly Chibale at H3D in, in, at the University of Cape Town. They have a drug discovery center that's one of the best in the world that's developing drugs for malaria, TB, and and other infectious diseases. And also Science for Africa, which is a funding organization in the, in, on the African continent, has uh, called for and funded a number of grand challenges projects that, uh, that focus on drug discovery. They have now built a drug discovery con consortium that I'm part of. So I want to tell you what we are doing with our drug discovery. So I mentioned the neglected uh, diarrheal pathogen enterogative E. coli. It's a huge uh, uh, um, cause of childhood diarrhea um, um, and malnutrition uh, in African countries. And I've been studying it for over two decades. And I think now that we might know enough about it to be able to meddle, to find small molecules that could not necessarily kill enteroaggregative E. coli, because we don't want to do that. That will select for antimicrobial resistance. But perhaps to dampen its virulence so that we could have either preventives or things that could be used with antibiotics to treat uh, infections. So what we decided to do was to screen a chemical library um, for compounds that would inhibit adherence by enteroaggregative E. coli. I couldn't have done this in Haverford College because libraries are incredibly expensive. But Medicine for, Ma for Malaria curates libraries and gives them free to researchers that work in lower middle income countries. So we're able to screen, first of all, one of these libraries, and now we've done another one, and find hits that actually inhibit the adherence of enteroaggative E. coli. So I had this great student who, by the way, isn't a microbiology student at all. He's a chemistry student, but he wanted to work with us. And this is chemistry. He's doing drug discovery. He gets his hits. He, he uh, does theoretical uh, uh, chemistry work to be able to redesign the hits so that they work even better. And for me, one of the things I wanted to know is what's the, what are the mechanisms of action of these hits? These are things that we we'll need to know for drug discovery, and obviously I need to know as a microbiologist. And the really easy way to do that was just to sequence the genomes of, of a bunch of organisms, look at the spectra of these compounds, and then be able to determine how the spectra of the compounds overlap with the presence of absence of various factors that we know that are involved in adherence. And by doing this, we've actually been able to find the uh, mechanism of action of a couple of his hits. Very efficiently, low budget, and um, working on a pathogen that's really important for our continent and not really important for anybody else. Okay, I hope in the time that I've been able to uh, uh, talk to you, I've not only been able to motivate you to be a bit bolder about who you let into your groups, or if you're a younger scientist, which groups you decide to go into. Um, and um, many of our would-be collaborators, they had no re real reason to join us uh, in microbiology. They, I believe they would have been equally successful doing something else, working in a bank, working in a communication company. I don't necessarily believe that I've, you know, I've made them richer or more successful, but I think they have really uh, enjoyed working with us and we've really managed to learn uh, a lot more than we would have learned if they were not with us. And so inviting them uh, uh, into our fold increases diversity and, and, and creativity. Um, and it's something that, you know, as you set out to do, very often, you know, um, um, inclusion is considered something that you tag on to your grant just to make it look like you're, you know, an accepting person. But I do want us to think about the fact that it's actually good for us to bring in people who don't think like us because then the, 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 the space in which we can think uh, is enlarged. Um, so um, I, I'd like to end there and just say that, you know, uh, uh, reiterate that uh, inclusion is not just about justice, it's also about creativity. Uh, really to thank Lindsay Hall and Gordon Dugan for nominating me for this. I, 
I honestly didn't believe, I, I thought all of us, them and me, were wasting our time on this nomination. Uh, so I'm really grateful that they did that. And in a way, it is a way of thinking boldly about who might do something differently. So I really want to thank them for doing that. I want to thank all the funders I've had over the, over the course of my career for also taking a chance on me. And uh, colleagues at Haverford College and now the University of Ibadan who've worked with me to be able to um, uh, include uh, lots of people in microbiology. The longest list of people I have to thank are actually the people who took a chance and did something different and then became part of our research program. Either our group became collaborators. Um, I want to thank all of them. Not all of them are even pictured on this slide and I couldn't list them, otherwise neither you nor I would see the text. So I really want to say thank you. And thank you to all of you who've taken the time to not, not have a late start this morning, but actually uh, listen to the lecture. Um, I'm very appreciative, thank you.